Good morning, everyone. The time has come and now is. Welcome. Uh, I'm Jessica Tate, the director of Next Church, and on behalf of Next Church and the amazing team of leaders who've worked hard to pull this conference together, um, welcome to Baltimore. We are glad that you are here. Um, there are 675 of you here this week. We're thrilled about that. You've come from all across the country and from Scotland, so we're thrilled about that. And 40% of you are here for the first time, so we warmly welcome you to this national gathering. For all of you, you're welcome to stop by the next church table this week if you've got any questions about the gathering or about um, the work of Next Church in an ongoing way. There will be leadership from Next Church there to answer any questions you have throughout the week. So please do take advantage of that. Um, there, were, there will continue to be an information desk out in the lobby as well. So if you have a question about where a room is or you lost something or anything like that, stop by the information table and people will be available to help you there. We are also live streaming the gathering this week, so welcome to anyone who's live streaming and watching us online. We're glad you are with us too. We've got a variety of ages among us this week. We've got a dozen children who are here with us. We've got 10% under 30, 10% over 65, and then the rest of us somewhere in the middle. Um, one thing that we're thrilled about this year is that a quarter of you are lay leaders, your ruling elders, and we're thrilled that you are with us and have taken time to be here. Half of you are pastors, and the other quarter of you are doing wide-ranging ministry in all kinds of capacities, from middle governing bodies to church musicians to nonprofit directors to community organizers and everything else you can think of. So we're delighted about the variety of ministry settings who are present this week. And you come from all different places, from urban areas, suburban, rural, small town, from small churches and large churches and everything in between from long established congregations and brand new ministries right out of the box, where he, those gathered here would self-describe as liberal or conservative or evangelical or orthodox or no box, please. All of us are here. And because God, and mo God moves and breathes in creative ways and through all kinds of different people, no two contexts are alike. So we are glad for the diversity. We celebrate that diversity among us. We've come from a variety of places to be together for a little while, these two and a half days together, to be challenged and inspired, to hear different perspectives from our own, and hopefully to be pushed and inspired to grow. There are many values of Next Church that we have held at the fore as we've put this gathering together, and we invite you into those values this week. The first is that everyone in leadership is here with an offering for you. We've not invited them because they're experts, but because they are good at their craft and they have some wisdom we think to share. So we hope you will receive it as an offering this week. Not everything you hear from up on stage or in your workshops will be obviously and immediately relevant to your context because we are coming from so many different contexts. So that we ask that you be open and ask yourself, what can I take from the spirit of this offering that might infuse my own gifts for ministry, if not the exact practice or model of ministry that's being offered. We work hard to make this conference a place of truth telling, which inevitably means that we need to hold things in tension. There's not gonna be an either or, but things are gonna be new, um, nuanced and complex. So we ask, we invite you into that complexity with us this week. When we're at our best over these next two and a half days, you will be encouraged you will experience God's presence, you'll be stretched to consider new things, you'll reconnect with people and hopefully connect with new people. But of course, we will not always be at our best, and so we ask for your patience and forbearance. Um, despite all our effort and planning, if something does not go quite right, or if we inevitably get off schedule, or something hits a chord or strikes a nerve with you, um, please be patient with us. Um, we will have, as I said, Next Church leaders at the Next Church table out in the lobby. So if there's something that arises that you want to discuss, please do talk with them. One last note about the schedule. It is chock full. That is by design 
because all of us learn differently and resonate with different parts of this gathering. And we know that God's spirit moves in all kinds of different ways, and we never know exactly the thing that's going to move you. So we offer lots of different things, and we trust that you will be a good steward of your time and energy while you're here. If you will be fed by packing your schedule to the max and doing every single thing we offer, go for it. If you would be best going to the bookstore, getting a new book, and heading up to your room, great. <laughs> if you um, would be renewed by spending time with colleagues um, around lunch or around breaks or signing up for something at the um, community board out in the lobby to, go to, people with, go to dinner with people, please do that. If you'd be renewed by spending some time, quiet time creating something in the spirituality studio, do that. Nothing on the schedule is required. You're not being graded while you're here this week. So follow where the Spirit is guiding you and take advantage of the resources as they are appropriate to you. Our desire, all the desires of the leaders and all those who've been involved in the planning is that this week will be one of hope, a place to connect deeply to one another. And we mean that as a theological statement as much as a practical one. This is a time to remind us all that the promises of God are trustworthy. They comfort, they challenge, but they do not let us go. And we hope and pray that will be your experience of the gathering this week. So now I want to welcome some of the team that has put together the thinking behind this conference and developed the theme for the National Gathering, the Desert in Bloom, Living, Dying, Rising as the Wilderness Church. And they're going to help introduce the theme to us and unpack it for us a little bit. So help me welcome them. The wilderness is both a paradox and a promise. The wilderness shall be glad. It's not... But it was, and it will be again. Scriptures remind us that we rest both in peril and promise. Day in, day out, resurrection is born of death, and new life is born of struggle. Isaiah 35 reminds us of this promise. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. We are gathered here in this particular place, at this particular moment, with our understanding that our country, our churches, and we ourselves are in a wilderness time. You don't need a conference to tell you that. <laughs> but what does the church look like when it leans into the wilderness? What do our lives look like when we stop plowing ahead long enough to observe the wilderness around us? What does it look like to follow the God who promises us new life, not just on the far side of the wilderness, but right here, where desert blooms might be sprouting beneath our feet? As much as we experience God's presence and absence in our particular corners of the world, we also know that we do not encounter this wilderness alone. If James Joyce is correct, that the particular always contains the universal, then we can trust that the Spirit can speak to us from any of our particular struggles. Indeed, if we are truly a connectional church, we have a responsibility to hear each other's stories and respond. Together, we can navigate the desert and claim the promise of blooming. So over the next few days, you're going to hear a number of stories from the desert in bloom. In his keynote, David Leong is going to pan out from Baltimore to share with us his vision of how churches in any context can better understand and engage with their communities, particularly as it relates to culture and race. All of the testimonies on your schedule are rooted in this particular place, coming from Baltimoreans who will share their experiences of pushing back against the fear of wilderness. And we're going to focus on Isaiah 35 in worship, 
Our preachers will share with us how they see God moving through the text and their context. And then finally, Jonathan Walton will explore the themes of wilderness through an entirely different lens, discussing how anxiety and mental illness can make it hard to claim the promises of new life, even as it blossoms all around us. All in all, we will explore the hopeful, the resounding collective resistance against fear and scarcity that exists in the church and society. We will push back against easy answers and hopelessness in pursuit of something deeper, the paradoxical promises of God. Our speakers come to us from contexts that may be different than yours or ours, but each of them, we hope, will speak truth that transcends circumstances. Whether your desert is racism or mental illness or isolation, whether you live in the city or the country or anywhere in between, whether you are a large church or small church or Lord, no church, you are connected to a much larger story of redemption in unlikely places. So we come together claiming that core theological truth. We hope you will hear echoes of your own story and the stories that we encounter at this conference. It is our hope that in the collective spirit of Isaiah, surely we will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God, that we will strengthen the weak hands, and make weak the feeble knees. <laughs> and say to those who are of a fearful heart, Do, do not fear, here is your God. God. Giving us new visions and new dreams. And doorways through dead ends. And yes, a holy way. A road for all of God's people. Where no one, not one person, We'll go astray, but instead we will sing of God's goodness. Because even here, 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 and yes, here, and also here, even in this desert place, we, we were made glad, and we will be glad again.
In the current religious and political situation, we wish to say a word about the type of Christianity that we hope to practice here. In public discourse, so often Christian language is co-opted and used for abusive and exclusive purposes. But to our Presbyterian understanding, precisely because we are about to enter a Christian worship service, absolutely everyone is welcome. We hope to practice Christ's disciplines of justice, love, hospitality, and compassion so that you might feel fully welcomed into the heart of God. We do not assume or presume you to be Christian. So however you've come to find us here today, if you're paid to be here in the sound booth or you are looking for a different ballroom and you found yourself here, <laughs> Wherever you are on your journey with heartbreak and joy and grief, you are absolutely welcome here today. And as we're mindful, perhaps, of those who aren't here, and keeping our hearts open that only 12 children somehow I feel empty, that we would be mindful of how, as we turn our hearts this way, our backs are somewhere else, and to keep our peripheral vision, to welcome anyone who might stumble through the door. and. And now we're going to cross this threshold into uh, a sacred time. And we invite you to come with us into some very ancient practices, some of the things we're doing, these rituals of standing and sitting, of eating together in a ritual way, are, are as ancient as, as the church itself. So we invite you to come along with us to enter into this, this different time, the time and conversation we don't have in the, in the drugstore, but we have here to transform the whole of creation. So we bid you welcome and invite you please to stand as you are able for our call to worship. Friends, this is our ancient story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. So no traveler not even fools who could go astray. God called us on the holy way where she was leading, and he comes to us again today to follow where he leads. She promised to go with us, and she is with us now. The wilderness shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom.
My daughters are three and four years old, so with apologies to my pastor, a great deal of my faith formation these days is coming from Disney movies. <laughs> and in the movie Moana, the beautiful world is beginning to die. And a dark force is taking life from everything, and Moana, a young girl, must travel across the sea to the heart of it all, a lava monster, a creature of fire and smoke and rage. And in the final battle, when all hope seems lost and the lava monster is winning and everything is fire and smoke, a quiet falls. And Moana chooses to see something different. So instead of fighting to vanquish the lava monster, Moana bravely and gently calls the lava monster to her. And miraculously, it comes to her. The waters part and it literally crawls to her as she sings, I have crossed the horizon to find you. I know your name. They have stolen the heart from inside you, but this is not who you are. You know who you are. Friends, the world is broken and dying, but it is not hopeless. Your sin does not define you. God knows your name. So please join me in confidence in our prayer of confession together. Holy God, in this dry and weary land, our souls are thirsty. We long for wholeness, for justice, for peace, for you, and yet our longing doesn't always lead us to those places. We recall the moments we've tried to quench our own thirst, make our own path, or be our own healer. Whisper to us the promises of your grace. Illumine the way home and hold us in your loving arms where all shall be well. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So when Moana speaks into the very heart of darkness, something miraculous happens. The lava monster is restored to her true self. She transforms into this beautiful, lush, green island with trees bursting with fruit and hills and flowers. And the richness of her new, true self is its hard to describe. It's life from death. It's a resurrection. And this reconciliation is what we are each promised for our yesterdays and today and for our tomorrows. In the midst of a world that is broken, a world that is not as it should be, a Savior has come to us to offer grace and forgiveness and new life and vision of something better for us and for this world. Friends, this is not an ancient story. It's not a fairy tale. This is for you, and this is your story. In a world that offers so many old lies and false stories, help us live into this truth. We are held by a love that, that we are not required to deserve. And nothing, nothing can separate us from that love of God. Nothing. O oh Lord, we believe. Help, help our unbelief. In the midst of our questions, doubts, and fears, we are bold to make our home in your new creation. In, in Jesus Christ, Christ we, are we are forgiven. forgiven. We, we are, are accepted, accepted and, and everything, everything is made new. new. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Release for the captives an end to the wars. Streams in the desert 
new hope for the poor. Little lame children will dance as they sing and play with the bears and the lions in spring. Join me. Alleluia, the great storm is over. Lift up your The great storm is over, lift up your wings and fly. The law is how we are to live in light of this loving God, to call for a new creation in the midst of darkness. The law reveals a world right with itself, and in a world with too much death and pain, here we choose to see something different. And we pass the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we believe will one day beat swords into plowshares. To summarize this law, our Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so, that you may live connected to God, to one another, and to your own truest self, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Please share that peace with one another. <laughs>
doing? <laughs> Woo! It was so nice watching y'all do that. Y'all so nice. Y'all just nice. This is nice. This is nice to watch. Good to see you. Do y'all feel as good as you look, huh? Yeah. Welcome to Next Church, man. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Billy. That's what my mama named me. I answer to it. You can call me that. It's so good to see you uh, here in this place today. I should do the prayer of illumination first. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock, my strength, and all of our redeemers, and all of God's glad people. Say amen. Amen. I should warn you right now, uh, I'm a call and response preacher. That's from my tradition. So, yeah. So you can, you can talk back to me and I won't think it's heckling. I promise. And part of all, and, 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 you know, and if you do heckle me, just be prepared. I heckle back, right? It's all good. And, and part of how this goes, we're going to practice is, you know, uh, if I say something you agree with, I mean, call and response isn't that deep. It's pretty simple. If I say something that you agree with, then you say amen, right? So, oh, y'all, yeah, okay, all right. So, so it goes something like this. If I say next church is great, then you say amen. Now, if I say something that you really, really agree with, I want you can say, preach short man. That's what I like people to say, okay? So let's try this this way. Let's try this this way. Next church is really great. Preach short man. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> you know, oh, this, is so, this is so great to be able to gather here together and to be in this space together. Thank you for having me here. I don't take this. Um, as a light responsibility because uh, you could be anywhere and certainly so many people could be standing in this spot speaking to you on this day. And so uh, to God be the glory to be able to be here with you. And I am honored to be with you uh, on this day. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have a theme that's been set out. Uh, you've heard it. They've already uh, alluded to it. And it sort of has its focus in Isaiah 35, the prophet Isaiah as he speaks um, and as words have been attributed to him in 35. I'm going to read them uh, so that they will be in your hearing, uh, and then um, I'll share some thoughts, um, and we'll, we'll go on. Isaiah 35 speaks these powerful words. I'm going to read it all, and you're going to hear this uh, throughout uh, the remainder of this conference as the other uh, preachers who come by me will also be sharing their reflections. And so uh, whatever I mess up, they can clean up. Praise the Lord. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give away. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. God will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lamp leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and in the streams of the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the haunts where the jackals once lay grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and the highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. Hear this, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. And gladness, somebody say gladness. gladness. And joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing. It's going to go away. <laughs> That's the Billy version. Amen. And here ends the reading of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. You know, as I was thinking about this scripture, I was sort of thinking, oh, it's a wilderness text. You, you get it. You see desert. You get the idea. You're all smart people. And part of what, uh, part of what I was thinking about is, you know, what, does, what really is wilderness? What really does this mean for, uh, for us, for us, these 
who have gathered in this room. And I went to thinking about, I, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and right up the street from our house was a fire station. It was a fire station, right? And uh, I, I used to love, I used to love fire trucks. And for a little while, because I thought it was so neat, every time, you know, there would be a fire and the fire truck would leave the station and it would go running, you know, you know how it is. It's a real dramatic moment. They all go hop on the truck and then they go, rrr, rrr, rrr. and every time I would see them, I would run out the house. I would run out the house and then they would come and I'd be jumping up and down and I'd be like, honk the horn, honk the horn. You know, like, you know, not really realizing that somebody really needs them, right? And so, so like, honk the horn. And then, you know, they honk the horn and, uh, and, and I used to love it. So, so, what happened, I even wanted to be a fire person for a little while until I realized what they do. And I thought, well, I'm not that courageous, you know. <laughs> but but um, and so I ended up being a pastor. <laughs> <Ta-da>! <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, so, so my grandma thought this would be a really good idea for me to buy him a fire truck. It would be a really good idea to buy him a fire truck for Christmas. So she bought me a fire truck. She was really excited. It was packaged. I remember it like it was yesterday. I unopened the fire truck, and it was opening the fire truck, and it was there. And so I was so excited. I was so excited. So I pushed the fire truck across the floor. I pushed the fire truck across the floor. Now, if there's anything I knew about the fire truck, it's supposed to light up. But I pushed this fire truck truck across the floor and it did not light up. I was so dejected. My ungrateful self sat there. I looked back at my grandmother like, you're such a failure. Like, what is this? Like, why, why do you buy me a fire truck that doesn't light up? And so she kind of looked at it. It's like, doesn't light up. I pushed it. So I kicked it to the side. I went over. I started playing with something else. Uh, she called my Uncle James. Now, he wasn't really my uncle, but you understand. She called my <laughs> Uncle James to come over to the house and she said, James, uh, I bought Billy Michael because she called me by my first name and my middle name. I bought Billy Michael this truck and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I don't know what's going on. She looked, he looked at it because we called my grandmother by her first name, middle name. He said, she said, he said, Minnie Lee, uh, I'll take it and, and see what's going on. He took the fire truck. He went to the store. He came back and all of a sudden he gave it to me. He said, Billy Michael, play with it now. I got it. And then I put the fire truck and it lit up and I said, oh my God, it's a fire truck. It's a fire truck. And then, and then my grandmother, she said, well, James, what'd you do? She said, Minnie Lee, all the thing needed was it needed some batteries. And he said it didn't have no power, right? And I thought then something pivotal about life, and that is some things just don't work like they're supposed to when it doesn't have the power. And, you know, the reality is that the wilderness for me is kind of like the church functioning without its power. Functioning without its influence, not, it's, it's there, it has all of the mechanics, it has all the machinery, it has the budgets, it has the programs, it has the, the clergy in place, it has the bureaucracies, the middle governing bodies, the higher governing bodies, the heavenly governing bodies, they have, <laughs> Jesus, they have them all. And, 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 and yet, even though we have all of the machinery, all the mechanics, it still just isn't working quite like it's supposed to work. For some reason, it just seems like it doesn't have the power. For some reason, it just doesn't have the batteries, right? And I've been asking myself, how does the church get the batteries of the Holy Ghost? Amen? Right? How, how does the church get empowered in such a way that it works like it's supposed to work? And for me, the wilderness is kind of like the people of God being in a place where they're looking around asking, where is the power? Where is the influence? Where is the, where is the inspiration that we have for the mission of God? It's looking around. And, 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 and I, I don't get involved in these conversations about the church dying because the church isn't dead. I got proof of that. You know how? It's about 670 of y'all here today. You alive, I think. Right? I mean, you know, I mean, well, some of you are alive. I mean, no, but <laughs> just joking. Right? You know, but, but we're here. I mean, the church is alive. It's not, it's not a matter of dying. The narrative of death is overplayed and it's inaccurate. Right? It's not, it's not a matter of death. The question is, how is the church changing, not how is the church dying? You see? And, 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 and part of what happens is in the wilderness, we wrestle with this reality of what? What, what, is it, what, what, is, what does it really mean? How do we find power in this new day that we find ourselves in? That's what we're really saying is how does the church find power in its mission in this changing times? And it seems like it's a wilderness. It seems kind of like uh, what the people of God in this text found themselves in. They were in a situation of transition, so many changing empires, so many changing sociopolitical situations, trying to understand what their mission and 
call is to their God and to one another in the midst of all this. Sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, sometimes getting it right and getting it wrong, finding themselves wandering around the mountain more times than they should have and not living up to their covenant and the prophet steadily having to remind them that you're acting like a wayward spouse. You're acting like someone who doesn't understand their commitment. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, the prophets begin to speak and begin to say something that I think can bless all of us because the church is in a searching season of wilderness right now. The prophet begins to declare these words and hear me, these are not words of judgment. These are not words of sadness. These are words of hope. The prophet speaks words of hope. He speaks words of hope. Now, this blesses me because I begin to understand something. That is that the wilderness really is about that juxtaposed place. It's about the reality that sometimes we live in this space, and it's already been alluded to, that there is the promise, uh, and then there's my reality, right? Uh, There's the promise of what the church should be. Then there's the reality of what we experience every day. Sometimes the church looks so much like Jesus, you can't believe it's made up of humans. And then other times, uh, the church looks so much much like humans, you can't believe Christ got anything to do with it. Right? You know, I mean, I have been to those churches, not your churches, nobody here. But I have been to some churches where I think y'all really should just take down the sign. Like, really, like, like, you know, like, come on, you know, like, you know, this isn't a church anymore, right? You know, and, and a part, and you know, my grandmother used to say, well, if they ain't going to sell fish, take down the sign. That's how I feel. If, 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 if we aren't going to represent Christ, take down the sign, right? And, 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 and part of what happens in this place is we begin to ask ourselves the question, well, well, what does it really mean to represent Christ? What does it really mean to have the power of God functioning in such a way that even in the changing times that we live in, we have a sense of mission? I just want to share some things that I think we can do what does the wilderness say to us right now in this moment because what this text says is that the wilderness speaks that's the most of what this is about I mean look what's happening the springs are springing up the leaves are speaking the water is speaking things are happening the wilderness itself this place of desolation becomes a prophetic voice for all my environmental justice people out there y'all my people the land begins to speak that's right you know the land begins to speak sometimes God is speaking but we aren't listening because it's not coming through human voices sometimes it's speaking through the land it's speaking through hurricanes it's speaking through the change Changing global warming, and that is not heretical, people, to understand the reality that, that, that when we look out into the atmosphere, the world and God is speaking through the things around us, do we have the ears to hear? The prophet says that the wilderness is speaking. What is the wilderness speaking to us in this season, next church? Let me suggest some things. I want to suggest that one of the things the wilderness is speaking, hear me very clearly, that the wilderness is telling the church that the gospel is spread through compelling, not through conquering. I mean, you think we learn that after like 500 years, but you know, <laughs> maybe, you know, I mean, but that, that, that actually people, people are not, con- people, people are not best introduced to the gospel by you forcing it upon them, but literally they need to see the reality of your life and be compelled to say, I, I want to follow the God that you serve. That's why Paul said, or whoever wrote for Paul said that the spirit is like the aroma of Christ, right? It's the aroma of Christ. In other words, it's like a fragrance that you smell, right? And, and if you've ever worn a fragrance that smells good, you know it smells good because somebody asks you what? What is that you're wearing, right? I mean, if nobody asks you if your fragrance smells good, it may not, right? It may not, right? So, so, so part of what he says is that, that, that you, we put on the fragrance of Christ, that literally we're supposed to have the aroma of Christ going off of us so that people want to know, who is this God that you serve? I want to know that God. They were first called Christians in a place where they were showing their love, and people said, I want to know this God. We do not represent Christ by conquering, by forcing it, using the Bible, our traditions, our rituals as hammers that we hammer people over the head with, uh, but rather we should use them as glue, whereby we weave their story with the story of the text uh, and help them to see the ways in which God is functioning in their lives and in our lives. We cannot uh, cannot do the work of God uh, by trying to conquer people and then bring them our Christ. Uh, We have to compel them by showing them the Christ in us uh, and then finding out that we have something to learn from them. Somebody say amen. The wilderness is also about telling and about having compassionate living, not just about correct thinking and correct polity. 
This one is tough for those of us who are part of the Presbo community. <laughs> I know, I know. But I often wonder sometimes to myself, I say to myself, I say, you know, I wonder if Jesus was writing the ordination exams, what kind of questions would he put? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, I, look, hear me, hear me. You know, I know questions like, you know, how many days, would Jesus say how many days before a congregational meeting? I mean, I know that's of <laughs> eternal importance, right? You know, I know, you know, I know, I know, I know questions like, well, who can move the flowers and the arrangements in the sanctuary <laughs> are, are important eternal questions, right, that one should answer. I mean, you, you went to seminary, you spent $60,000 to answer the question about the flower arrangements. I mean, this is important. But if Jesus was writing the ordination exam, I imagine he might ask questions like, this person is naked, how do you clothe them? This person is hungry. How do you feed them? I mean, I mean, I think I'm in the book somewhere. You know, and part of part of what I'm asking is that that although there is a place, and I do believe this, I took the ordination and I passed, right? I took these exams, right? And I get, I'm not saying, but what I'm suggesting to you is there are more important questions about compassionate living uh, that we should be concerned about, like how it, not just about correct thinking and correct polity, right? Uh, but what about correct compassionate living, like like how do we exemplify in the Greek splat? Nitsomai, where literally it rises up from our bowels when we see injustice in the world. It rises up. We can't, we want to be quiet like Jeremiah said, but we can't because it's just like fire that's shut up in our bones. Some of us wouldn't preach if it was our choice. I know I wouldn't, but, but it's not my choice. I have to preach. I have to tell the goodness of God. I have to speak about justice. I have to speak about love because that's the kind of God I serve. It's about compassionate living. Here it is. Here's another one. I think the wilderness is speaking that it's time to stop complaining about the church that you're a part of and start being the church that you envision. Listen, if you came here this week to complain and moan about the church, stay in your room. That's what it's about, right? Like, like, this is about envisioning what it means to be the type of church that God says, yes, that's my church. I'm proud of it, right? It's about envisioning. That's what next church is about. It's about talking about what the church faithfully looks like in the world in which we live. And it's going to look different in a lot of different contexts. And yes, it's not always going to get it right. But don't just sit around complaining. This is not about complaining. This is about the act of having communal generative thinking together, right? This is about how it is we find ideas inspired by God uh, about how God might be leading us out into the world uh, to be powerful witnesses for God. Uh, and this is, this is the one that's really important to me. Hear me. I believe the wilderness is faithfully speaking in this moment and telling us, this church, this church, this 98% white church, uh, it's time for you and I to get involved in dismantling systems of white supremacy. Listen. Listen, 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 listen. Let me just say it like this. There's a wonderful tradition, a lot has been done in the last 40 or so years to help uh, to rectify some of the wrongs. The Confession of 1967 and uh, the Belhar Confession, all of those are very nice statements and articulations. We appreciate them, you understand. Right, uh, but 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 I want you to understand that 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 I I've decided, and, and those of you who follow my blog know this. I've decided I'm not going to talk about racial reconciliation with any of you anymore. Huh. I love you, but I'm not doing it. No. I'm not doing it until that conversation includes conversations about restorative justice. Yeah. But don't talk to me about racial reconciliation if we aren't going to have conversations about racial repair. Because white supremacy isn't just about a set of statements, it's about systems of privilege that have been put in place uh, that advantage some and disadvantage others. And how do you dismantle those systems? If we can't talk about that and the effect of those systems, then what conversation are we having? You can't stab me in my back nine inches, pull it out six, and call it progress. You want me to give you a cookie? For putting out sick, no, I need you to pull it out my back, bandage it up, and then at least say I'm sorry. But I digress. 
These are the types of things that need to happen when the wilderness speaks. And finally, what I like about this text is that in the midst of all of this, the wilderness says, I, the wilderness is speaking, watch it, it speaks a word of joy. And what's the joyful thing? The joyful thing that says that all of this work I'm talking about, we don't have to do it on our own. What makes us Christians, what makes us Christians, what doesn't just make us a good you know, a, a social club or a political action group or whatever, is that we believe that our work is accompanied by the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God comes in the midst of this and helps us to do this work. I want you to try this week to ask God this one thing, Lord, I need you to put some super on my natural. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is crazy for some of you. You haven't been talking about the spirit and the supernatural, but it's real, beloved. And we just have to ask God, God, we can't do this work. We can't do the work that you're saying by ourselves. We need the supernatural power of God to come and enable us to do that that we cannot do on our own. I was told that's called grace. And when the Spirit of God comes into your lives, when the Spirit of God comes into your church, your committee, your session meeting, when it comes into your advisory committee, whatever kind of committee, when it comes, it's going to come in such a way that I hope it inspires you to be better than you want to be on your own, to be more courageous than you'd want to be on your own. I tell you, when the Spirit of God comes, I declare I'm a witness. It's better than what the phone booth does for Clark Kent. It's better than what the spinach did for Popeye. It's better than what the lasso of truth does for Wonder Woman. It's more than what vibranium does for the Black Panther, somebody in the room. <laughs> when God puts super on your natural, it's better than a stage and a mic for Beyonce. It's better than a meeting that runs on time for Presbyterians. <laughs> when God puts super on your natural, my God. It does something that's powerful. It does something that's powerful. It causes the crooked places to be straight and the rough places to be made plain. You want to save the church next? Let me help you. It's real simple. You want to save the church? You save the church by sharing the church. That's it. I know I got that part right because Jesus said that you want to save your life. The only way you can do it is to lose your life. What you talking about, Billy? I'm going to tell you this story and I'm done. In our neighborhood, I go sometime and I play up in the neighborhood that's close to where our church that we're starting uh, in, in, in Atlanta. Some days church planning is hard. That's uh, newsflash, right? <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and so some days I'll leave the facility and I'll go up the street and I'll play with these, these, these kids. They don't go to our church at all. They don't go to our church. But I go and I play with them. I talk with them. And I hang out in the neighborhood. I kind of see my role uh, in addition to being a minister as kind of being what I like to call a community theologian, right? I like to do theology with the people. And so I go up there and I'll sit down. And there's this one kid. He's adorable. I mean, he's dope. What I like to say, he's dope. He's dope, right? And, and I say, this is just the dopest little kid ever. Like, we'll rap and freestyle together. We'll do all types of things together. And, and, and one day he told me, he said, you know, um, he said, Billy, my, uh, my birthday's next week. And I was like, that's good. That's what's up. That's what you're going to do, little homie. And he was like, well, he's like, I don't know. You know, I don't know. My mom and daddy, you know, they got to work, so forth and so on, you know. So, you know, I was like, all right. I was like, look, I'm going to come. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you. We're going to talk. He's like, okay, cool. He's like, so I can't. I said, what can I, what can I get him? I got to bring him something. I said, I know he likes ice cream. I said, I'm going to get him ice cream. I got him a scoop of ice cream. I got up there quickly so it didn't melt because, you know, he'll clown me if I bring him melted ice cream. So I brought him up there, and I said, hey, hey, man. I said, happy birthday, man. Here it is. He turned around. He said, oh, you brought me ice cream, man. I was like, yeah, I brought you some ice cream. So he told all, watch this, watch this. He told all of his, all his friends. He, he said, line up here, line up, line up, line up, man. He's like, big homie here brought me some ice cream. So he got the ice cream cone, and he took a lick. Then each one of them came and took a lick in a line. Lick. Lick, lick. So I'm watching this like, oh, this is really, y'all, y'all really close. And then after this, so then, look, then he turns around to me. He say, hey, Billy, we saved something for you. <laughs> so I kind of have a saliva phobia, but... You know, I said, but I said, man, I really appreciate that, man. This was it. And he says, so I took him, I took him, I said, man, you a real dude. He's like, that's what's up. And you know, I was walking away, I was like, that's exactly what the church is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about sharing what it is we have with other people, saying, this is so good, you got to take a lick. You get a lick, you get a lick, you get a lick, you get a lick. <laughs> And for all of you people saying that ain't in scripture, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You want to save the church? Go back to your home 
and tell people, you get a lick, you get a lick, you get a lick, you get a lick of the grace of God. Do me a favor, look at somebody, tell them you get a lick. Amen. Give some praise and glory for the word of God. I hope, I hope you hear my heart when I say this, you can do it. Amen. Offer the world a lick of the goodness of God and watch that lick change the world. Amen. Won't you stand all over this place? We're going to end because this text ends with singing. That's what it says. They're going to sing in the wilderness. That's what they say. And so here in this place, in whatever wilderness you find yourself in, it may be a personal wilderness. I don't know. It may be financial, professional, ecclesiastical, whatever, theological, you know. I don't know. But I want you to know that even in the wilderness, wherever you find yourself, God says, I want to use you. And for God to use you means literally just to operate in the flow of God, to vibe where God vibes. Join me in singing this song of the church. Anywhere, Lord, at any time, I'm going to let God use me. Let's sing together all over this place. If you don't know it, act like you do. If you don't believe you get a lick, I don't know if this is going to convince you. Um, if that didn't do it, um, uh, this is uh, the, the beginning of, uh, of an invitation to the table. Uh, it's a song by a guy named uh, John McCutcheon. And uh, he tells the story that this is the way his mom used to call him and his eight siblings to, uh, to the table. So... Um, this is uh, his way of saying you, you get a lick. on the table everybody come in we've been playing by the river and I'm tired to the bone she's calling all her children home home to the table and the big black pot everybody's got enough though we ain't got a lot no one is forgotten no one is alone when she's calling all her children home everybody's sitting in everybody's place with their fresh scrubbed fingers and their fresh scrubbed face it's quiet just a minute while sister says a grace like she's calling all the children home home to the table and the big black pot everybody's got enough though we ain't got a lot no one is forgotten no one is alone when she's calling all her children home 
I can hear her voice in the middle of a crowd. It was never too late, it was never too loud. Smelled just like home by the time you reached the door. There was always just enough, there was always room for more. Out in the desert, down by the sea, hear her voice calling Ollie Ollie in free. From the cities to the forest where the wild beasts roam, she's calling all her children home. Home to the table and the big black pot Everybody's got enough, though we ain't got a lot Home to the table, home to the feast Where the last are the first and the greatest are the least Where the... Home to the table, home to the feast where the last are the first and the greatest are the least Where the rich will envy what the poor have got Everybody's got enough, though we ain't got a lot No one is forgotten, no one is alone When she's calling all her children home Home to the table and the big black pot Everybody's got enough, though we ain't got a lot No one is forgotten, no one is alone From the shacks of Soweto to the ice of Nome from Baghdad city to the streets of Rome, she's calling all her children home. Moisha, Isabel, Sifo, Kim, Muhammad, Mikael, Red Hawk, Tim, Johnny, Mary Claire, Lulu, Jeannie, Kevin. Jeff, Patty, Nancy, Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We remember the new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we are accepted by God. We come to have communion with the one who has promised to be with us always and with each other. And we hope that at this table, we might remember our deepest identity as children, beloved by God, so we might better live into who God has created us to be. The table around which we gather is not a Presbyterian table or a next church table. This is Christ's table. And Christ invites everyone to dine with the divine Wherever you are on your own wilderness journey, you are welcome at this table. And because we don't want anything we say or do to be a barrier between you and the love of God, to the best that we can, we get out of the way. If you are here, you are welcome. God be with you. And also with you. Open up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Holy and right it is, and it just makes sense, to give thanks to you in all times and in all places. So we come to this table with thankfulness. You created heaven with all its host, the earth with all its beauty, and creation with all its charm, and we are thankful. Your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, and we are thankful. You give us life and being, you hold us in your loving arms, but you have shown us the fullness of your love by sending into the world your son, Jesus, and we are thankful. We also come to this table with longing, Gracious God, in this brief moment of silence, 
we recall our longing to you. We long to meet you at this table, to taste and see that you are good. We long for connection with you, with others, with our own truest self. We remember your unconditional love for all your children. We remember your unconditional love for us. We long for a world where everyone belongs, where there's enough where all of life can flourish. May this feast be a foretaste of that world. And we come to this table with hope in a life of dead ends and disappointment, loss and loneliness. We hold on to hope. We cling to hope. We hope that in this meal, you might give us a taste of a future where we are okay. Mm -hmm. And perhaps with your grace, we might live in the present trusting that all of life is, your, is in your good hands. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O oh God, that your whole church would soon be gathered into your maternal embrace. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And in the spirit of remembering, we pray the prayer that we remember that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. On the night he was arrested, Jesus took bread, and after having blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a similar manner, after they had finished, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new testament, the new covenant, the new promise of my love poured out for you. As often as you drink this, do so, remembering me. Taste and see. Drink and remember. We will serve communion through intinction. So there will be servers on the walls um, around the room and two gluten-free stations up here in the middle. Um, so we invite you, um, don't worry about being decent or in order um, <laughs> as you receive communion this morning. I'll invite all of the servers forward. Friends, come for all things are now ready.
please pray with me. Loving God, thank you for calling us by name, for making a place for us at your table, and for feeding us. We pray that having been nourished at your table, having rested in your loving arms, that we have seen and tasted and remembered that you are good. May this glimpse remind us that indeed, when we share, there is enough. And that for you, enough is more than a feast. God, we pray now that you would direct our steps, that we might walk in the ways of peace and compassion so that every day that we might just look a little more like Jesus. And in doing so, that we would live being creators of justice and joy. We pray all this in the precious and strong name of Jesus. Amen.
So, friends, what does it look like to go out into the wilderness to invite others to taste and see and to taste and see for ourselves? Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to all that is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Amen.